Coming up on this Friday edition of Newsline at Noon, President Parkinay is considering withdrawing some of her cabinet minister nominations to break a political deadlock and win opposition support for her reform drive. The United States says it's ready to broker a ceasefire between Israel and Palestinian militants in Gaza as the death toll grows from the escalating hostilities. First global financial markets plunge amid growing concerns over the health of Europe's banking system after a trading suspension of one of Portugal's biggest banks. These stories are more on Newsline at Noon. It's new Friday, July 11th here in Korea. Thanks for tuning in live from Seoul. I'm Oh Jin Ju. Good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this lunchtime. President Park Geun-hye, who made attempts to renew dialogue with the two main rival political parties this week, has a very important decision to make. Right. She secured bipartisan agreement for passage of her key reform and economic related bills, but the opposition party has asked the president consider withdrawing some of her cabinet nominations. Chu Sun reports. President Bak has often been criticized for her lack of dialogue and communication with the opposition party. She countered that criticism this week by meeting with the ruling and opposition party's floor leadership for the very first time. The president and both parties' floor leaders met for talks, and the fact that we are going to meet on a regular basis means we are restoring politics. A major development from Thursday's talks was an agreement to pass within a month a bill designed to prevent a repeat of tragedies like April's deadly ferry accident. With an aim to pass the special legislation on the Seolho ferry at the July 16th plenary session, the policy chiefs of the two parties will start negotiating the bill with the standing committees. The ruling and opposition sides also agreed to seek passage of the government's post-ferry disaster reform bills and bills aimed at revitalizing the economy in August. But with five of President Buck's eight cabinet nominees now confirmed by the parliament, the opposition is requesting that the president specifically reconsider two of the three remaining nominees for their alleged thesis plagiarism and false testimony. Although the president can appoint her cabinet without parliamentary confirmation, there's a big political risk if she goes ahead without considering the opposition's request. On the other hand, the president also cannot afford further delays in her government and public sector reform plans after her two failed prime minister nominations. Choi Yusun, Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye's chief aide Kim Gi-chun has rejected claims that the presidential office of Cheong Wa-de is the ultimate control tower in dealing with disasters. Speaking at a meeting of the Special National Assembly Committee on the Seodo Ferry Disaster on Thursday, the presidential chief of staff said the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters under the Security Ministry played the role of the control tower. He went on to say that the presidential office is only responsible for reporting the situation to the president, not for ordering rescue operations. Kim has come under fire from lawmakers who say he is responsible for mishandling the rescue operations. The president's chief aide criticized the Coast Guard's sloppy handling of the situation, but said the main culprits were the ferry's captain and crew who abandoned the passengers. And moving on, the United States and China say they see eye to eye on North Korea's denuclearization. Wrapping up their two day annual talks in Beijing Thursday, both sides agreed about the important urgency of curbing Pyongyang's nuclear weapons program, but they remain divided on how they will approach and persuade the communist state to do so. Shimon Gil reports. 
The U.S. and China promised closer cooperation on denuclearizing North Korea at the sixth round of U.S.-China strategic and economic dialogue. The U.S. says China shares the same strategic goal and that Beijing must use its unique role to persuade Pyongyang to give up its nuclear ambitions. However, the U.S. State Department declined to comment on whether Washington and Beijing had agreed to enforce sanctions on North Korea more rigorously. China has been an important partner in the implementation of sanctions, and even as recently as last year, they took a number of important steps. China's top diplomat Yang Jiechi said Washington and Beijing reaffirmed the importance of realizing the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula through consultations, and that two countries can do more to relax the situation. During a meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry said both Washington and Beijing agreed to work harder. But I do want to emphasize that we reached agreement that we need to both do more and we are prepared to in order to try to move North Korea on the subject of its denuclearization. Washington has long pushed for Beijing to use its status as North Korea's only major ally to pressure Pyongyang. North Korea has conducted three nuclear tests since 2006 and has been threatening to conduct a new form of a nuclear test. Pyongyang has repeatedly expressed a willingness to reopen the six-party denuclearization talks without preconditions. The six-party talks involving the two Koreas, the U.S., China, Japan and Russia, have been stalled since late 2008. Kim Young-gil, Arirang News. Now, for many South Koreans, Japan poses the second biggest military threat following North Korea. This according to a survey conducted by the East Asia Institute in Seoul and a Japanese think tank. The results of the survey released on Thursday are an indication of South Koreans' discomfort with Japan's view of history as well as its move to expand the role of its military. Over 46% of South Korean respondents chose Japan as the most threatening country uh, following North Korea, which was at over 80 percent. Last year, in a similar poll, Japan was only ranked third, trailing North Korea and China. Some 2,000 South Korean and Japanese adults took part in this year's survey conducted in May and June. More than 60 years of separation have made North and South Korea extremely different places. And although Koreans from both sides of the border share essentially the same language now, their understanding of one another is extremely limited. This is most true for the younger generation of North and South Koreans who will be looked upon to lead if and when unification occurs. It was with this in mind that the South Korean government hosted a special youth camp on Thursday. Now, Shin Semin reports. This 24-year-old North Korean defector, known only by his family name Kim, fled his home country because of economic hardships. His first attempt at defecting ended in failure, and he was sent back to the North, where he ended up serving time in a prison camp for fleeing. But his desire for freedom never waned, and Kim finally made it safely to the South seven years ago. Facing some 100 South Korean middle school students at a youth unification leader camp held on Thursday, Kim and one other North Korean defector shared their stories as part of a program organized by South Korea's Ministry of Unification. The goal is to raise awareness among younger South Koreans about their neighbors to the north and prepare them for possible unification in the future. Now that Kim is legally a South Korean citizen, he says he wants to study. I want to study so I am prepared for the future, especially when the two Koreas unite because I have to help those North Koreans adjust to the changes. And until that day comes, South Korean students have goal of their own. Spreading the vision for unification is something I continue to do with my friends so eventually I can go to the North and better appreciate our history through cultural assets. Although we were brought up under different political systems as Korean people, it is our job to embrace all people until we can freely commute anywhere on the peninsula. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Stay up to date on the latest news out of Korea. 
connecting to our team of reporters about the issues that matter to Korea. On air, on your mobile, online. Find out more about Korea on Newsline at Noon with Mark Broom and Ah oh Jin-ju. Even when I'm Ah oh Jin-ju. Market researcher, strategy analytics said Thursday that LG Electronics brought in about. Global stock markets slept on fresh concerns over the health of a leading Portuguese bank. The latest crisis in the European nation is raising fears that the country could fall into financial trouble once again. Huang Jie tells us more. Stock markets in the United States and especially in Europe took a massive hit on Thursday. France lost almost 60 points, and in England, the markets dropped 45 points. Wall Street recovered most of its nerve at the opening of trading, with the Dow losing 70 points, the S&P 500 falling 8, and the Nasdaq 22 points. So what is haunting the market? The soundness of Portugal's top bank, Banco Espírito Santo. The tension centers on Espírito Santo International, the largest shareholder in the bank. It allegedly missed a debt payment this week and was held responsible for accounting irregularities. Amid the feeble pace of economic recovery in Europe, analysts say the rally in global stock markets shows that investors are still very worried about the overall financial health of the region. That's also raising fears that Portugal might face a crisis again just about a month after emerging from a bailout. Portugal's regulator halted trading at the troubled bank after its share price crashed 17 percent. The Portuguese government insists that the bank is solid and that the drop in stock prices simply reflects trouble at the parent company. Investors, however, are skeptical, saying they have heard such reassurances in Europe before and that the size of the problem remains remains unclear. Hong Jie, Arirang News. World Population Day is marked around the world on this Friday, July 11th, but data shows Korea faces a bleak future in this regard. A study by the Korea Institute for Industrial Economics and Trade shows Korea's competitiveness will soon begin to wane due to the shrinking number of economically active people due to the fast aging population and low birth rate. It also says Korea will fall into the lower ranks of OECD countries in 16 years. Korea's competitiveness through population is expected to fall to 21st place by the year 2030 from 17th place in 2010. The institute says the nation needs a strategy to boost the birth rate before it becomes an extremely serious economic and social conundrum. Chance prices in Korea are fast closing in on record levels, according to KB Kumin Bank's real estate statistics. For those who are not familiar, Chance is a unique system in Korea where tenants, instead of paying rent, cough up a hefty upfront deposit, typically a large percentage of the property's value, which is then refunded in its entirety or renewed after a set period. The nation's Chance to purchase price ratio climbed to a near 69 percent last. Last month, a single percentage point shy of its highest level on record set in October 2001. The southwestern city of Gwangju showed the highest at 78 percent, followed by the southeastern city of Daegu. Seoul was at 64 percent. Analysts attribute the upward trend to a growing number of people feeling less inclined to buy because of uncertainties about the housing market. Now, another science fiction fixture has become a reality. Korea's LG Display, the flat screen maker of LG Group, has unveiled an 18-inch flexible OLED panel. The panel can be rolled into a cylinder with a radius of just three centimeters without affecting its functionality. The display maker also revealed a transparent OLED panel of the same size with a transmittance of 30 percent. LG plans to develop both transparent and rollable panels of more than 60 inches by 2017 in a bid to lead the race in the display market. And in more tech news, Korea pretty much laps the world in average internet connection speeds, but the country's staggeringly fast internet and wireless network speeds, of course, didn't just happen by chance. Fierce competition in the telecom industry to meet the very high demands of Korean customers continues to drive the rapid pace of development. Connie Kim reports. 
Using the world's fastest wireless network, Park mi Sun can download an hour-long online course on her smartphone in about 30 seconds. Using the mobile IPTV, I stream movies and take online courses while I'm on public transportation. It's very convenient. I can download the videos quickly and watch them in high definition without ever getting disconnected. Necessity may be the mother of invention, but competition doesn't hurt either. A fierce battle for network speed in Korea's telecom industry gave birth to the broadband LTE Advanced Network. We found our customers wanting to download larger sized videos. With the launch of the LTE A service nationwide, we are now able to better meet those needs. About half of all smartphone users have used their devices to download movies, and Kim says that the number is expected to reach about 70 percent within four years. The service is almost three times faster than the existing LTE networks and 15 times faster than the 3G services that have been available since 2006. But the speedy broadband LTEA network won't be limited to smartphones. The convergence of broadband LTEA and other related industries, such as wearable devices and the Internet of Things, will gain momentum. The smart car and smart building sectors, along with the big data industry, are other possible benefactors of the fast speeds that broadband LTEA have to offer, not to mention its capacity to accommodate large amounts of information at lower costs. And the next upgrade on top of this broadband LTEA is expected to be commercialized at the end of this year, and that means it's going to be quite costly for ordinary consumers to keep up with this trend, given that these smartphones don't come cheap. Connie Kim, Arirang News. The World Cup in Brazil reaches its climax this weekend with Sunday's final, Argentina versus Germany. No one ever expected Korea to still be in the tournament, but everyone had hoped that they put in a stronger performance than they actually did. Uh, head coach Hong Myung-bo has stepped down to take responsibility for the poor performances, but the deep-rooted deep -rooted problems with Korean football remain. Song ji reports. Someone had to take responsibility, and this time, it was two people who withdrew from their positions. The vice president of the Korea Football Association stepped down on Thursday, along with head coach Hong Myung-bo. The seat is empty for now, but it won't be an easy position to fill. Ten managers have held a highly coveted seat over the past dozen years, after Gus Hitting led the Korean squad to a fourth-place finish at the 2002 Korea-Japan World Cup. But each has only stayed for slightly over an year on average, after one or more losses in international matches that brought them under fire. Selection of the national team coach has generally been a top-down decision from Korea's Football Association. Its technical committee must provide professional insight to the process, but lacks the authority to influence the decision-making process. Now, the incumbent president of Korea's football governing body says that will change. We plan to reform the technical committee so the team can perform better on the international stage. We'll also restructure all levels of the organization so that it better caters to the national squad's needs. Those reforms and the selection of the candidates for national team coach must take place soon with the next international match set for September and the Asian Cup in January just six months away. Song ji Arirang News. Time now for a look through the international headlines we're following on this Friday. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim standing by at the News Center. Yes, Eunice, at least 88 Palestinians now reported dead in the only three-day-old crisis on the Gaza Strip. And uh, U.S. President Barack Obama said the U.S. is ready now to broker a ceasefire. Hi, guys. That's right. World leaders are now calling for restraint as U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon had also hours earlier appealed for a ceasefire between battling Israelis and Palestinian militants. Kwon Soa has this report. The U.S. says it's willing to broker a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, 
The White House said U.S. President Barack Obama told Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on the phone Thursday that he's ready to help end the escalating hostilities on the Gaza Strip. He also reiterated that Israel has the right to defend itself against Palestinians' rocket attacks. Secretary of State John Kerry spoke to his Egyptian counterparts trying to make him use Egypt's influence in easing the situation, as the country played an important role in brokering an Israel-Hamas ceasefire two years ago. The surge in rocket fire was triggered amid an Israeli crackdown on Hamas members, which began after the abduction and killing of three Israeli teenagers last month. A suspected revenge murder of a Palestinian teenager followed a few days later. Hamas has reportedly launched over 550 rockets into civilian areas in Israel. Israel responded with over 500 airstrikes, part of their Operation Protective Edge launched earlier this week. Israel responded with over 500 airstrikes, part of their Operation Protective Edge launched earlier in the week. UN Secretary General Pan Ki Moon made a passionate appeal for a ceasefire during an emergency session, saying Gaza was on a knife edge. Uh, today, we face the risk of an all out escalation in Israel and Gaza, with the threat of a ground offensive still palpable and preventable only if Hamas stops rocket firing. The UN the chief called on the international community to work to with Israeli and Palestinian leaders to stop the situation from escalating and said the region cannot the afford another full-blown war. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And staying with the United Nations, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has named a veteran UN official as his new envoy to Syria. Stefan de Mistura spent 40 years at the global body, holding top posts in Iraq and Afghanistan. His predecessor had resigned in late May after nearly two years of failed efforts to end Syria's spiraling civil war. He was the second official to do so. Meanwhile, a new report has been released on the human cost of the struggle against the Bashar al-Assad regime. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights reports some 170,000 people have died since the conflict was documented beginning on March 18, 2011. One-third of them were civilians, including more than 9,000 children, some 15,000 outsiders who entered Syria to join the jihadist fight were also among the dead. In a dramatic display of aggravating U.S.-German relations, the German government has ordered the CIA's Berlin chief to leave the country. The move comes as Berlin discovered a suspected U.S. spy in its own defense ministry. This days after a German foreign intelligence worker was detained on suspicions he too was a CIA informant. And in her most pointed words on the issue yet, Chancellor Angela Merkel called spying on allies a waste of energy in the end, adding that there are many important problems on which attention should be focused. Germany is one of America's closest European allies, but relations have degenerated after reports that U.S. agents bugged the cell phones of several German leaders, including Merkel. And finally, Chinese hackers may have tried to harvest the personal information of U.S. federal employees with top security clearances. A New York Times report cited top U.S. officials who said a database connected to the Office of Personnel Management was targeted. Confirmed by Homeland Security officials, it said the breach attempt happened back in March, though it is unclear whether any information was actually stolen and whether the Chinese government was involved. China's foreign ministry spokesman Hong Lei called the Times article a part of an irresponsible anti-China smear campaign. Good afternoon. Well, it's going to be another sizzling hot day today. The high in Daegu is expected to soar to 
34 degrees Celsius, but it could feel hotter than the actual temperatures due to the dazzling sunshine. Though right now we are seeing few clouds covering up the peninsula, but it will get sunnier as the day goes on. So don't forget to gear up with sun protection items. And as we can see, heat wave advisories have been expanded and advisory have been upgraded to warnings in some regions. So uh, try to stay indoors between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. because this is when the sun is at its strongest. Young children and older adults should be especially careful. And it seems like this heat will continue this weekend, though temperatures should be a couple of degrees lower than past few days under mostly two partly sunny skies. So please do keep this in mind and let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The high in Seoul will rise to 32, while Daegu will have a high of 34, and Gwangju and Busan should make it to 31 one this afternoon. And for other regions, Jeju Island and Daejeon should see a high of 27 and 33, and Tokyo will reach 28. Well, that's all for Korea, and here's the international weather for beers around the world. And those are the stories we're following at this hour. Jinju and I will be back at the same time on Monday. Have a fabulous weekend. Until then, goodbye.